Hello, everyone, and happy Tuesday. We have an extra special treat. We have a guest speaker here with us, Grace Stevens, who is amazing if you don't know her. Um, she's a former educator turned educator empowerment coach, which if you're sitting there going, what is that? I promise you we are going to get into that. But today we are going to be talking about why it is dangerous to make teaching your like whole identity. And I speak from that like from 100% experience. I have one 100% made teaching my identity way too much of my life. Um, but I want to go ahead and bring Grace up on screen with me. If you are here live, please say hello. Let us know where you're joining in from. And Grace, thank you so, so much for joining us here over on Instagram. Okay. My absolute pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, Bryson. So before we get too far into the weeds, I would love for you to introduce yourself and kind of tell us a little bit about yourself for those of us that are watching that don't necessarily know who you are. Okay, so um, I was a second career teacher. Uh, I was uh, doing really well in the corporate world. By the time I was 30 years old, I was VP of a huge uh, corporation. I had made all kinds of all the goals that I had set for myself financially and everything else. And um, regrettably, uh, I was stressed out, burnt out, overwhelmed, just, you know, all the things really um, had a lifestyle um, that was unsustainable as far as my stress level went. And I really needed to make a change. And so I decided I would um, follow up, pursue my childhood dream of becoming a public school teacher. Uh, now, at that time, I had two very young children. Um, I also had to commute 50 miles one way to get to school after dropping off the two little kids um, to go get my credentials. So it wasn't without, you know, a lot of effort that I became um, a public school teacher. And um, I loved it, but it was a huge change for my family and a big, you know, kind of a lot of sacrifices were made. So it was important for me for this to work out. So I started teaching, it was amazing. And uh, sometimes I say, you know, life's like algebra, right? You keep getting the same test until you pass it because, you know, a couple of years in, I found myself in the same place. Overwhelmed, stressed, anxious, the complete lack of boundaries, saying yes to everything and miserable again. And I just, I could not change careers again. Um, I decided I needed to change me. And so that's what I did. I went in this 20 year deep diversion while I was still a public school teacher, which I did love, but I had to learn for myself how to overcome overwhelm, overcome burnout, how to set proper boundaries, how to, um, I like to call it hack my own happiness. And um, I, you know, I have a, a long history in my family of, uh, you know, not so great mental health. And so I was really attuned to wanting to make sure um, that I kept a good, healthy work life balance and all those things. And so anyway, that's it. I, I, I taught for 20 years about I wouldn't say 15 years in, maybe um, a lot of people kept mentioning to me, like, how is it your experience is completely different from our experience, you know, taught in the same small school. Um, and we all had, we only had one um, grade level per grade, one teacher per grade. So we all had the same kids. We all had the same families. We all had the same administrator. We all had the same resources, or should I say, lack of resources. And yet my experience was dramatically different. I just seemed to be having a better time. And so people asked me about that. And I said, well, you know, these are some of the habits I practice. And um, they said, oh, you should turn it into a book. Uh, so I did. Um, I wrote a book, Positive Mindset Habits for Teachers. Um, and it resonated with a lot of folk. I'm real excited that it is actually um, a few teacher training colleges that I know of actually make it mandatory reading in the their teacher training programs. So that's super cool. Um, since then, I've written um, other books about teaching. But after 20 years, I said I would be a public servant for 20 years, which drew me right up until the end of uh, 2022. So I did teach through and after the pandemic. So I do know things are different. Um, but I did decide to turn my focus 100% on empowering 
teachers to have a more positive teaching experience. I feel like teachers can create their own path. They can create their own happiness. The narrative around teaching is pretty negative, um, but I still feel there's lots of opportunities. Um, and, and, and what I teach is not just like kind of a positivity band-aid. It's, you know, scientifically validated habits um, on how to be happier and i felt like my impact for um, could be greater if i work with teachers because the more teachers i work with it would impact more students so that's how i came to be here um that's kind of my origin story i i love your story because you bring up a lot of points that even if people don't have the same you know background of leaving leaving a different career and coming into education we all feel a lot of those same things. And I love yeah. that you have people that, you know, there are teacher colleges that are actually talking about teacher burnout and how to really take care of us more than just the, that positivity bandaid, which is a great term. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, you know, cards on the table, we've known each other for a, a little bit now, and we've, we've had a lot of conversations about what it means to be a teacher and what that looks like yeah. and how, how it can be really really difficult to to balance everything and we we kind of end up on two sides of the same spectrum which is you know teacher quit talk and hashtag yeah. teacher life which is you know yeah. i'm out of teaching i'm done this is forever you know whatever the system is broken or i'm a teacher everything about me is a teacher so how do we find that line in the middle? So before we get there, I guess, let's talk about making teaching our entire identity, because I think it is a little ironic that I am, um, I'm talking about how we shouldn't make teaching our, our entire identity when I have for a long time been very much so really kind of taken in that role of I am that music teacher and really made that in my identity. So can we talk a little bit about maybe a time that you felt pressured to make teaching your identity, how it affected you or how you've seen that in some of the teachers that you've worked with? Yeah, no, I think it's really prevalent. Um, when I first started teaching, you know, I had a lot of my identity had been wrapped up in being a VP, right? I was on this big career, but I was the first person in my family ever to go to college. And I ended up going to university in four countries using three different languages, right? I was a super achiever. So, you know, when I got this corporate job, I was gonna climb that ladder. And like, I was so, I really wanted that title. Um, and yeah, and I wanted the VP life, like I wanted it. And I got it, I had it, I had the huge house and I had the huge, you know, account for um, expenses and two beautiful cars and all this stuff. And you know what, miserable as sin not gonna lie, had two beautiful young children, totally disconnected from them. And so I decided that I needed that not to be my identity, right? That my worth was more than my work, right? I couldn't entangle the two. And I really felt like teaching had purpose, such a great purpose. And so I felt that was really important to me, but then I did the exact same thing. Now, part of it was, um, kind of accidental, right? So I start teaching and I just, I need stuff. I need stuff. So every birthday I'm like, I need books for my classroom. I need, I remember one year I started a um, donors choose um, for, I had like 10, 10 boys in my class who were like ADHD and I wanted wiggle seats and the school had like no resources. So for my birthday, my friends were buying me wiggle seats, right? And before I knew it, everything I had, like every time it was my birthday or Christmas, somebody would buy me, you know, a teacher t-shirt or, or even like before I bought anything, right? Okay, you're gonna laugh like, oh, can I buy these shoes? Ooh, can I teach in them? You don't ever say it like everything about your life is now, of course, my young kids were in school, too. So a lot of our life was about school. But I did feel that kind of this is my identity. Now, everybody I hang out with was teachers. And um, I feel the pressure now is even more because of social media, because of, yeah, it is this kind of hashtag teacher life, you know, teacher life. We've got the teacher style box. We all hold our, you know, our our, um, we do our girl math so we can justify having our, you know, frappuccino and all that stuff. Like there's so much pressure to make something your identity. And um, it's very dangerous. It's dangerous for a couple of reasons. One, because it's not healthy. 
complete lack of work-life balance and it's the fast track to burnout. And two, like I said, the bigger issue is attaching your worth to your work, especially when it is teaching. It's very harmful because we don't have kind of like um, an output that we have a lot of control over. You know what I'm saying? Like if you're an architect and you plan a building and then you bring it to fruition and you see this beautiful building, right? Or I'm a quilter. I can take little scraps of nothing and make a beautiful quilt. Like there's something tangible. With teaching, we don't have that. Right. What we have, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure somebody will say, well, we have student outcomes. Well, yeah, what? Standard testing? Come on now. We know better than that. Right. We have so little. We have a lot of influence, but there are so many things that are beyond our control in education. And so if our whole identity is wrapped around, you know, being a teacher, what happens when we do have, you know, a bad day in the classroom for no, you know, I mean, there are so many variables, right? Like there are just bad days. Even when we're bringing our best self, something else can happen. And then when your whole identity is tied up with it, it really, like I said, it leads to a lot of burnout. We need to be complete people, not just a teacher. You bring I've up a point. There. Yeah, you bring up a really point that I think will ring true to a lot of my audience of music teachers, which is so many of us went into music education because we loved music. And then we went into yeah. music school and that became our whole thing. We're a music major. That's our identity. And then we became music teachers and that's our whole thing. But a lot of us, I know that I really struggled um, because for the longest times, my self-care was music. And then I was burning out because of now the music I was doing and my normal thing that I would do to fix that would be music, but I didn't want to because I had made yeah. my identity so tied to what my work is um, for better or for worse. So I think you bring up a really good point that is re that really kind of kind of kind of poked at some things that I, I definitely had to work on when I first kind of le left high school, went into college and, and started teaching. Um, so we talked a little bit about balance earlier and about you know we shouldn't okay we shouldn't make our whole identity our teaching but is it possible to find balance between work and life and if so what does it look like how do we recognize when we're not doing that so um first off like i'm gonna really like my heart hurts with what you just said <laughs> because uh, my first um I said I was a quilter, right? And I love to quilt. And I was really tasked at a point where I needed a side hustle, as many teachers regrettably do, right? It was a financial reality. I, I became very suddenly a single parent. And so my first venture before somebody convinced me to write about teaching um, uh, was to start a quilt design company, uh, Patterns. And you know what? I learned really quickly. I took something that I had loved and I turned it into work. And now my, my relaxation from work was gone. So I see what you're saying about music. Like my way of relaxing was quilting. And now that was my job. Like I, I started to really not enjoy it at all. And it was really sad. So I totally get where that's at for music teachers. So um, yeah, that really kind of, gosh, um, I had not really thought about that before. So, um, well, how can we keep balance? You know, it takes intentionality. We can't keep waiting for things to get easier. We can't be like, oh, after concert season, after report cards, after this, after that, we're going to keep like, there'll just always be more work, right? So we need to be we need to be intentional. And we need to have a, a, a framework, some tools um, to say, how am I going to prioritize? How am I going to say when enough is enough? How am I going to set healthy boundaries around where I'm going to put my time and my energy? And then where am I going to be intentional outside of school in having other interests? And, and let me just say, it's not just um, people who over identify with teaching. A lot of us, especially if we're parents too, we take so much pride in, I'm a teacher, you know, I'm all about the hashtag teacher life um, because our kids are in school too, right? And then, um, oh, and I'm a parent. And I just want to say that in um, 
from my own experience, if any of your listeners are maybe getting a little older, those two areas of your life are going to end at exactly the same time. You're going to think about retiring right around the time your kids are off your payroll, right? Right around the time your kids become independent and go off lifing as they should. If you've done your job, you've given them them roots, you're giving them wings, off they're going to go. You're going to have an empty nest right at the same time as you stop teaching. And then you're really going to be lost for an identity. Without being a teacher and without being a parent, who am I? Right? If I haven't had any other interests or identities outside of that for the last 20 years, 30 years, whatever, it's really, it's really going to be difficult. So I would say that the way to keep balance is to first with awareness comes choice. I always say that to anybody I'm coaching with awareness comes choice. I, you know, we, I do exercises with people. Let's, let's ha- draw an avatar of ourselves of our entire life. And like people are like, I oh, got nothing to put on there. Okay. That's not an exercise to shame you or to make you feel guilty or bad about it's to give you knowledge. Knowledge is power with awareness comes choice. So I always encourage people start with making a little, you know, like at the beginning of the school year, um, I taught littles first, second, third, fourth, and we would make a little picture of ourselves at the beginning of the year. Or if kids were insecure about their um, drawing skills, one of the things I like to do was give them a a template of a t-shirt And I would say, decorate the t-shirt with all the things you love or things about you you want us to know. And then we'd hang them on the wall. And I would do, um, you know, I would do mine. And lo and behold, I would draw a picture of myself um, standing in my sensible teaching shoes uh, with my flippy hair. I would have my Starbucks in one hand. And in the other hand, I would have, now some of you might not know what a teaching stick is, but before we had smart boards, We used to point to things on the wall. I taught first grade, you had to point to the sound spelling cards. Do you remember those from school? And I'm really short. I know on the internet, I look so tall, but um, I'm fun sized. I could reach nothing. I had a long teaching stick with an apple on the end and I would point to things. So every picture I would draw of myself, I'd be wearing my sensible teacher shoes with my Starbucks and with my, um, with my teaching stick and i would just kind of laugh like really is that my whole identity and then kids would say oh mrs s what do you like to do and i would say oh you know oh i like to do yoga i like to ride my bike i like to you know but then if i was really honest with myself you know my yoga mat had cracks in it because it you know hadn't been unrolled for two years you know what i'm saying so that was how I say the first thing is really do an inventory of how much of your time do you spend teaching versus anything else in your life. And if there is nothing else, then that's your first warning sign. The other warning sign you're going to have is you're going to be burnt out. You're not bringing your best to yourself to the class every day because you're getting low key resentful. That's just the honest truth. Right. I'm always here. This is all I ever do right? You have that conversation going in your mind. It's not healthy. You're not a whole balanced, you know, individual um, that has things to bring to the table. It sets an awful example for students and and your own children, if all you do is work. Um, So I don't know if that answers your question, but definitely... You brought a really good point. I think one thing that we don't really think of, we know that teachers often get burned out, and yeah. one thing that I think you really, you kind of touched on, but really hit me hard is that you don't know that you're, you're, you're going to have a problem until you do. So you, you, yes. you know, be making teaching your enti- entire identity is going to be fine until it's not. And the problem until is, it's is not. when it's not, you, there's nothing else to fall back on because you've made so much of who you are as a person in that identity. I know a lot of us battled that during COVID, um, especially very yeah. early on when, you know, our life was going to school, being with the kids, making that impact. And then all of a sudden we were stuck at home. We had a screen, everything was changing. And I'll be honest, I really struggled during COVID because I, you know, especially not, not, not saying that non-music teachers didn't struggle, but like 
music is so social, communal, um, things that we're doing together, we're touching, we're dancing, we're sharing, we're singing, you know, and all of a sudden all that was taken away. And again, none of us expected that to happen. But for me, that was my big wake up call where I realized, oh, teaching was my whole thing. And now I'm really struggling. Um, So kind of touching a little bit on COVID, um, while there are a lot of things we've learned as teachers through COVID, (laughs) I I think one of the things that was an incredibly unintended consequence was the term self-care became incredibly weaponized. Oh, God. Because it was just like, just take self-care. Okay, when? How? How? What does that look like? Um, you, know- you know what? I, I got to tell you, I just, it's so funny you said that. I was all fired up this afternoon. I had recorded a podcast episode just yesterday and I was annoyed. And I was like, when the heck did this become so weaponized, right? That it's, the insinuation is teachers are lazy and careless. That if you're getting burnt out, it's because you're just not making time for self care, right? Where is the responsibility of an institution to say, like, s- systematically, like the, these problems are ingrained that we are so overwhelmed and there are so little resources? And to just slap a, even I find when districts have good intentions and try and do something, it's a one and done. It was a check off, right? I'll be honest with you. I was on a wellness committee for my district for three years, and they were the years. 2019, 20, actually 21, 24, four years. Those were all the COVID years. You know what was never once? We met once a month for four years. Never once talked about teacher mental health, teacher burnout. It was never there. It was always about, oh, um, vaping in the bathrooms. Um, Kids, we did some farmer's market so they could learn about healthy eating. It was about giving parent resources. In fact, I made this resource. It was like a 30-day wellness challenge for school only because I was so embarrassed that my administrator didn't go to these meetings and I had to give them a roundup for what our school had done, which was... And so I was so embarrassed to sit there month after month. I made a resource myself. I'm like, oh, we're doing this wellness chat. I was a fourth grade teacher. Was that my job? No, but like I had the skills to do it. And um, yeah, no, it has become very weaponized. So if you're waiting for your district to give you permission to do less, yeah, good luck. Um, It's not going to happen. Not because any administrators are, are evil, but because they're as overwhelmed as the rest of us. There is, they are as incapable of setting boundaries as we are stuff gets dumped on them they dump it on the teachers because they don't have the skill set and the confidence to say no to who's ever dumping it on them so it's a massive problem um, as educators as a whole because of who education attracts let's say helpers problem solvers people who want to have impact code for people pleasing conflict avoidant right? We don't necessarily know how to say no in a comfortable way. If we say no, it's not in my contract, we get looked as very um, inflexible, not in it for the kids, right? We get guilted massively. You know what's not good for kids? Uh, Teachers who are worn out, resentful and burn out and really toxic to kids, right? Your energy teaches more than your lesson plans. We know that, right? So um, I think it's really a big... um, a a big problem that a huge part of self-care other than recognizing that we have human needs like i said when i put together this episode um i was going through you know seven steps and the first one was take care of our human needs we need to eat you know we need to sleep we need to hydrate i spent 20 years not drinking during the school day because i was too far away from the bathroom and there was no coverage and we need to eat healthy food and then i laughed i'm like oh my god that's Maslow's hierarchy of needs right there and the teachers aren't following it right like basic human needs but on top of that the biggest thing was like getting comfortable with setting boundaries in a way that is student focused right in a way that that gets buy-in from administrators like because it's based on the students not on I'm worn out and I don't want it to do it because it's not my contract um, <laughs> which is sometimes what we come up with because we just can't argue anymore. We don't know what else to say, right? But coming up with real reasons to protect our energy and our passion uh, 
so that's really but that's so funny you said that I literally look I got all filed up there because I do I was so tired of hearing that like oh just invest in self-care you know to which I want to say well get me some subs how many times you want to take a mental health day and you get guilted into not taking it because there's no sub coverage which you know my immediate thought on that is that problem's above my pay grade yep I don't get paid to solve that problem I get paid to write the sub plans. The fact that the district has no subs, how's that my problem to fix? Yeah. Right? So first I need of all, to take a mental health day. So first of all, you've mentioned your podcast a couple of times, so I want to share it. It is called yeah. the Balance Your Teacher Life Podcast, correct? Yeah. Yeah. You have to yeah. check it out. It's really good. It's really actionable. She keeps it short and sweet um, <laughs> most of the time, but even when, when it goes a little bit longer, she's always giving really good tidbits. Um, speaking of good tidbits, before we get any farther in today, I want to invite anybody. Yeah. Um, to, we're actually going to be doing a live training um, in, in a week. Is, is that in a week? A week or so. Yeah, yeah, week. Um, exactly. So yeah. all about creating boundaries, defending those boundaries. Um, so if you actually comment here live on Instagram, um, just leave us the word boundaries. You should hypothetically uh, get a DM that has all the information on how you can save your free spot in this webinar, this workshop. It's going to be great. Um, but speaking about kind of boundaries, because again, I feel like logically we know boundaries is like the root of all self-care. Um, let, without getting too far into boundaries, because I know we're going to be getting that into that in our workshop, uh -huh. um, what does what can self care look like for teachers? And I mean, I know the short answer is saying no, uh, but beyond just saying no to things, um, what might that look like? So it looks like a lot of things. It is know the difference between pampering and authentic self care. Because if we're the kind of people who follow along social media, hashtag teacher life, uh, we're, we've been sold a bill of goods that uh, self-care is a face mask and a mani-pedi or a beer with our buddies when we watch the game. Uh, that's pampering. That's distraction. Those are all excellent, beautiful things. They're not authentic self-care. So authentic self-care is one, yeah, taking care of your basic needs. Like, you're human. Listen, you would not. Let's give an example. Let's say you have a health issue and it's not critical, but it is annoying and it's uncomfortable. And your tendency is to wait till spring break or summer or whatever to take care of it. And I know that because I've done it myself many times. And what turned out to be a little issue turned into a big issue because I didn't take care of it. You know what? I used to tell myself, would I do that to my kids? My kid came and said, I, I had bursitis in my hip. I limped for six months before I went to a doctor. If my kid was limping, would I really say to my child, who I love, will take care of that own summer? Suck it up, buttercup, for the next six months. Right? No way, right? So we purport to love ourselves, <laughs> but we don't take care of ourselves that way. So I would tell people, take care of yourself like you take care of your child. Some of us take better care of our plants and our pets than we take care of ourselves. Okay, so that's number one, right? Just take care of your physical needs. Go to the doctor when you need to go to. If that means taking a day off work, take the day off work. Again, no sub, not your problem, right? Your problem is you need to be healthy. You can't pour for an empty cup. So that's number one, to take care of your human needs. Number two is have a support network, right? Have a balanced life. That means you have a support network of people who are in education, and outside of education, I have dear friends who I love so much, whose teachers are parents, um, whose parents, excuse me, are teachers, their siblings are teachers. What else do you ever talk about? Like you need a balanced kind of um, support system, right? So um, you need to have friends and family members and conversations and activities that are not about teaching, right? That's an important part of self-care, okay? So that's two things you can do. Three, yes, learn to set boundaries, right? On your time, it's not just saying no, it's about who do you hang with? How do you deal with people who are toxically negative when you're tasked with working with them, when they're on your team 
and you cannot avoid them. You know, how do you protect yourself from that? That's all self-care is protecting your energy, right? Those are all parts of um, authentic self-care. So yes, while a bubble bath and a Maddie Peddy is awesome, um, that's not really, you know, self-care. You're taking better care of your skin than you are of your sleep. That's a problem. I, I love that last quote. Take care of your sleep. <laughs> again, because again, we all know... <laughs> We love skin. We love our skin and we want it to look great and flawless. But again, and we want if- our mask and we want our everything. And then we like, we're going to bed with our devices, with the first thing we look at before we even get up and, and like are thankful that we woke up. I mean, at my age, we're thankful we wake up in the morning and we're already like, oh, we're looking at social media, which is basically what are people I don't even know arguing about so I can get upset about it before I even get out of bed. Like that's no way to take care of yourself. So, so I have to say, my <laughs> biggest piece of self care that I did, I it, it happened in the middle of the pandemic when yeah. we were constantly getting an email that was like, "This <sighs> brand new thing. Oh, you can do this now. Oh, just kidding, you can't do this. We're a new revised schedule. All this stuff going on." The best thing that I've ever done for myself was removing my school email from my phone. I oh, yeah, have never looked back. And, you know, I, I, I try not to judge people that keep it on their phone because I get it. But like the the level of anxiety that I used to feel every time my phone would vibrate because I thought it was a parent complaining about something, another change in schedule, something going on. Like I have never looked back on keeping my email off my phone because it has just changed the the outlook that I have. It's really made it so much easier for me to say, all right, you know what? It is my time. It's not school time. Yeah. E- even if it's my 30 minute lunch, I'm not checking my email. I'm not, I, I might be on YouTube during my lunch, whatever. I don't want to get an email that, that takes me out of it. So I'm going to go a little yeah, off script no. here. And I would love to know what is your biggest, what is like the biggest thing that you've done personally to, to kind of focus on your self care. You're not going to like the answer. I opted out of all social media. And here we are on Instagram. <laughs> um, I just opted out. I just, I, I, I was every day uh, on TikTok um, posting and I enjoyed it, but I noticed that I was getting drawn into this thing, which was that what got the most engagement was the most controversial stuff. I noticed if I was complaining and I was annoyed, I got hundreds of thousands of views. And when I would put up like a self-care challenge and here's 10 days of self-care and positivity, my brand is positive mindset habits for teachers, right? And I would get no engagement in that. And I found that really um, kind of um, demoralizing. And so for my own mental health, I took a break. I went home last year to be with my 87 year old mother. And I wanted to be very present with her. And part of it was she didn't have Wi Fi in the house. So that was kind of helpful. And, and, and once I'd been off social media for a month, I was like, you know, it's like anything which I, I coach people to do, do an inventory of your mental diet, right? Some of us do, you know, are very careful, we, we wouldn't eat candy and french fries and chips and wash it down with beer every single meal and expect our body to function well right those are treats once in a while the same way but we're not mindful about what we put in our in our brain when we're watching streaming the news cycle which their whole agenda is be afraid and buy stuff. Don't get me even onto that, right? Like we're just doing all these things, our nervous system, what doesn't have the capacity to absorb that kind of trauma, right? It's like drinking trauma from a fire hose, right? And so, like I said, getting upset about different things, like it was just easier for me to do the things I know that are good for me, which are taking some quiet time for reflection and everything else, um, if I stick, clear of social media um and i know that's not going to be everybody's cup of tea but at least limit it um and so i took those apps off my phone um i still have class dojo on my phone i love class (laughs) dojo but i'm very good even though i don't even teach anymore i go back and i look at some of those little videos and stuff and the kids sometimes still mention to me um i was very good about putting you know the notifications turning them off at a certain time and so i felt when i proactively managed with um 
with parents, I would tell people, I, I would say, listen, these are the hours I check email. You can send me an email anytime you want, right? I, I, that's fine. But be aware that these are the times I check it. These are the times I do whatever. So it was just a re-education piece. So I would say really the biggest self-care thing for me in the last few years has been definitely, but that's my thing. Some people just, you know, love social media and, and it fills them up. I'm very mindful. You know, I can't binge true crime and watch the news and, um, and then go to bed and expect to have a good night's sleep. I'm just, I have a nervous system that is uh, kind of hypervigilant towards trauma and, and, and lots of people do. That's just what I ended up with from a genetic standpoint and quite honestly from um, growing up in a pretty crazy household. So, you know, maybe there are people out there who it doesn't affect them, but it affects me. But the point is know what affects you. Don't just kind of work. I'm going back to with awareness comes choice. Figure out what works for you. Um, a lot of people just go through um, life kind of reacting, um, unaware that they can proactively manage a lot of things and influence a lot of things. And I think the school system is one of those things that we get so busy on the hamster wheel, just trying to get everything done, that it's difficult to take a step back and say, wait a minute, why am I doing this? What could I do less of? What have a strong compass? For me, I always had a strong compass. Does it impact student outcomes? It was that simple for me. When I had to go through, if I had a list, I always made a not to do list. I'd get all the stuff that was dumped on me and I would just start throwing, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing this till I get the second email. Because to me, it didn't affect student outcomes. I always had a very strong compass about that. Um, I think maybe because I came to teaching later in life, um, I never wanted to be, um, there was a lot of pressure to, oh, you were really big in the business world, you know how to manage budgets, you should be on the admin track, you should negotiate for the union, like there was a lot of pressure on me to do other things that maybe other people would have attached their ego to. But me, I was like, I want to be with kids, that's what I signed up for. So I was never insecure about, oh, this will hurt my career path if I said no to things because for me my I had a strong compass that was always student outcomes and so I think that's like the biggest thing that somebody can do is like what is important to you most stress in life shows up when your actions don't follow through with your values so if you don't know what your values mm. are life's going to be stressful and when you have a compass for your values um, it's easier to um, avoid burnout and make intentional choices and um yeah that was a big answer yeah that was a lie i loved it though um so Sorry. one <laughs> one thing that kind of as we've been going through this entire conversation that keeps yeah. I, I just feel like i'd be remiss if i didn't mention is a lot of the reasons we as, as teachers struggle with this type of thing of saying no and and not being a people pleaser is if we look at the history of education oh. teacher, teachers are historically women and that is just the the way that the system is broken is is basically saying that women don't deserve this and clearly that is not the case but unfortunately the education system has latched on to that feeling of we we should just be happy that we have a job because we get to make such teachers an and nurses yes and you know teachers and nurses kind of going off that point i i do think it is comically hilarious that teaching teaching and nurses don't even get our own appreciation week we have to share it um with each other but <laughs> but I, but i think that no, to me no i'm sorry let me just say this to me my, one of my pet peeves when i was you know and i taught the littles and we all wanted to make the beautiful things for earth day what kind of crap is earth day we're supposed to be in love with the earth every single day. And I feel that same way about Teacher Appreciation Week. Like, no, you need to appreciate me all stinking year. Don't bring me a bunch of candy. I'm diabetic during Teacher Appreciation Week and call it good. Like, um, have a little respect during the year. Um, hold your children accountable for some things. Um, but yes, no, it is definitely, it isn't because we all have this pure heart. We want to 
and I'm generalizing, but it teaching does attract a lot of people who want to, well, it's just set up. It's a vocation. It's a calling. It's a job. Yeah. It is a job, right? Oh, we're a family. When did we confuse employment with adoption, right? It's a job. Um, and it can be a beautiful job and a job you exactly. care deeply about and a job that impacts the world and impacts the future. And I believe those things 100%. But at the end of the day, if you called in dead tomorrow, you would be replaced. Let's yeah. say if you called in rich, you won the lottery. I used to laugh. We used to, did you ever do the pool where you're, when the state lottery was really big and you'd all put in the pool and I taught with a staff of 14 and we'd all buy the tickets and we'd be like, oh no, what are we going to do if we win? We can't all quit. And we would have this big, long hypothetical conversation. And I'd be like, I'd finish out the school year. I wouldn't leave anyone in a lurch. I mean, come on. <laughs> We're worried about winning the lottery. Like, oh my gosh. Like, so yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a job. We don't come to it with that. We come to it with it's a vocation, it's a calling. Um, and those are all ways of kind of guilting us, whether it's intentional or not, to keep giving and giving and giving until that we're like the giving tree until there's nothing left to give and somebody's sitting on our stump. And then, um, and then that's it. So we got to take account. We got to take responsibility for it. We got to take accountability for it. We've got to feel empowered to make our own choices. I'm really big on telling teachers other people's, you know, experience doesn't need to be your experience. You get to have your own experience, right? You get to have your own experience. And if other people are having a very negative experience and they're giving it. 10,000% and unfortunately they've bought into this idea that the last car in the parking lot is the most virtuous teacher. <sighs> That's not true. You have to have a confidence about yourself that says, I really don't care what other people think. I know that I do right by my students. My students perform well. They know they're safe with me. They know I care about them. They know I'm invested in their success. Um, you know, I can be relied on. I bring the best I can of myself every day. And um, I'm, I'm grateful when things in the classroom go well. And I'm gracious when they don't. I don't overreact. I don't, you know, blow up. And the only way that you can do that, be calm and consistent, is if you practice authentic self-care. And like I said, the huge part of that is having the confidence, the skills, to set boundaries. We're never taught those skills. As a little girl, I was always told, you know, do what you're told. Don't talk unless spoken to. I mean, all the things, right? You're here to serve. <laughs> those are all the messages that we're given. And I um, mean, the long run, they do not serve us. And so, and there's, and perfectly, I mean, I was, I'm not good. I am going to brag. I was everybody's favorite teacher. I dressed up like, um, like an umpa um, There was never an activity, like a PE. If I took the kids out to PE, I know other teachers who would, you know, oh, good, it's a free prep period. They talk in the corner and let the kids have free play. Heck no. Let's play uh, dodgeball and I'd be on the girls team. You know how much fun it is to throw a ball at your third grade teacher, right? Like I was in there playing with them, having a good time. And the only way I could do that was I was energized and, um, and know when to say no. So I'd love to okay. zoom and in on that a little bit because we, <laughs> me, I would let, me being on the girls team. Well, yes, <laughs> you, you, you throwing dodgeballs at your students. We'll zoom in on that. Now I, we <laughs> all... I said they threw it at me, but yeah, there were a couple of kids I was happy to nail. I'm not above it. <laughs> I'm not above it, man. I'm just going to put that out there. I'm so, human too. Sometimes so that was honest. my stress relief. <laughs> we know that teaching and being an educator result is the result. A lot of the problems are the result of an incredibly broken system that will take yeah. a lot of work to fix. Yeah. How can teachers take some actionable steps to challenge that uh, the societal pressure to prioritize teaching above everything else? How can we take some steps, even like tomorrow? Say we have someone who's watching that is debating taking a sick day because they just feel awful, but they have XYZ in the morning or there's no subs. 
how can we take the first steps towards challenging these pressures? You got to reframe. You've just got to reframe in your own mind, like what is important here, right? How good am I to anybody if I'm not a whole, complete, fully functioning human being? What example does that set to my students? I'm going to show up not feeling good. Now I've come to school not feeling good. I come to school, I had no voice. And I'm telling you, those students gave me so much grace. They were so excited to be the spokesperson. I would, I would put it on my phone text. One would be the rider and they would put it on the board. You know, I didn't feel terrible. I just didn't have a voice. And I knew that I had enough trust with my students that they could do that. But there are other times, you know, real bad headache or whatever, like I'm not going to school. I don't, what am I going to put my head on the desk and put a sweater over my head and put in a video, Bill Nye the science guy, and be mad when, you know, unscheduled time, which is an invitation for kids to monkey around. I mean, we all know that, right? So I think, you know, the thing you got to do, you feel sick tomorrow and you don't want to go, is you just got to decide, like, why, what is it? And there's no easy answer to this because I'm not a therapist, <laughs> but and neither do I play one on Instagram. Um, but really question yourself. What is it about me that feels I'm not worthy of having a sick day? I'm going to bring it back to your kids. If you're a parent, would I make my child go to school if they felt like this? Why am I doing it to myself? Right? Why? What is it? about me that feels I need to be a martyr and burn myself at the stake to be a good teacher. Because that's simply not true. That doesn't make a good teacher. Like I'll say it again, your energy teaches more than your lesson plans. Teach Kids want teachers who are happy to be there. They know that. They're like dogs. They, they sense your energy. They know if you're resentful and just trying to get through the day and going through the motions. And conversely, they know if you are, you know, not every day is great in the classroom. You're not always happy, clappy, skipping around. But as a general rule, I was always happy to see my kids in the morning. Like, huh, all the things I taught in a Title I school, some of those kids, I mean, the issues those kids have, I never once opened the door in the morning without seeing that line of kids and thought what a kind of small miracle it was that we all made it back. And I would say that, whew, we all made it again. We're going to be all right for the next six hours right? I felt that. They felt that. It's going to be okay. <laughs> We're going to get through it. We're going to have a little fun. We're going to learn. We're going to support each other. You know, I believe in you. Um, that's a different vibe than somebody who's showing up to school feeling sick. So you deserve the best of you. Your students deserve the best of you. And um, the world has enough stinking martyrs. Go write that on a stick note. I mean, like I said, I'm the queen of, um, you know, positive mindsets. I could give you all the beautiful, you know, research based and whatever else, but it boils to down to that. Put it on a stick note. The world has enough martyrs. What I love about you is you are the first one. <laughs> I'm kind of straight to it. I'm just, I you don't are, beat around the bush. Exactly. You are the first one to send, send positive sparkles when we need it. <laughs> but you're also one to like tell it exactly how it is. You're not is one to it? mince words. Um, you just say it how you, you tell it. You tell us what we need to hear. And I think that sometimes we get stuck in this false dichotomy over teaching is this wonderful thing where we get to have this great impact and change the world and teaching is this broken system where people are underpaid and overworked and the reality is it is such a spectrum and it it's can, both it can flip from it's one to both. the other and it can be both and it's just we need to understand that quite frankly our you've talked about how we as teachers can 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 make sure that our experience isn't the same as others but i i have to say one of my most one of the most frustrating things that i see is when i see a teacher in one of these giant facebook groups asking for help for something and they get basically told that that's not an issue and it's their problem uh, because yeah. that one teacher that commented doesn't think it is, or they have never had that problem, or they've never had, they've never, they've never fought that fight. And it's just, I, I think 
so often time, and I say this as a music teacher talking to not a music teacher, we we get <laughs> stuck in fighting over who has it worse. When I think the reality is, is we are all overworked. We are all underpaid. It doesn't matter what you teach or how many preps you have or how many IEP students you have or how many meetings you have after school, this, that, the other thing. We all are part of this broken system. So let's stop worrying about fighting each other and start doing some things to take care of ourselves and make some changes to that system. Okay, I'm going to say something. And it is one of my big strategies that I work and I teach people, especially when people are native um, and you want to limit your exposure to them is why do we stinking compete? Why do we compete? Like, let's say, let's give the scenario exactly like you just said. So one person will come to me and be like, you know, oh my God, like these kids, oh, you won't imagine, you can't imagine what happened in class today. And okay, you know, it's legit, whatever. If it's your teacher bestie, you listen to them. But you know, if it's that person that complains about everything all the time, shoots down at any solutions you ever had, but then you're like, oh, well, that's nothing. I have this, right? It's a competition. Who has the worst kids? Who has the worst parents? Who slept less? Who has more independent studies? Yeah, who has more or less preps? Like all that thing, we feel this need to compete with it. And all that does is kind of add negative energy to it. I call it like keeping a spreadsheet. So fun fact, before I wrote about teaching, I actually wrote about relationships for a long time. And I was always would tell people, you know what? If you're keeping a spreadsheet in any kind of relationship, right? Who had the kids more? Who spends more time golfing than you spent with your girlfriends? You know what I'm saying? You know what it is keeping a spreadsheet, right? In your mind, you got this. I have this many kids. I have this many behavior problems. I have this many, you know, kids on IEPs, whatever. If you're keeping a spreadsheet, like somebody's winning and somebody's losing. And in any kind of relationship, if there's a winner and a loser, you're both losing right? So we're supposed to be a team. We're supposed to be all working together with this strong moral compass for the kids, right? And so everybody's issues are valid. Everybody's issues are valid, right? It, you can't kind of compare. One, what's stressful to one person might not be stressful to somebody else, right? You can't invalidate other people's concerns. And it is, the system is broken. And two things can be true at the same time. You can love teaching. I love teaching with all my soul. It doesn't mean that I wasn't fed up of um, a lack of support when I, some kid who's, you know, I'm having to do a room clear twice a week. And, you know, it's the cliche, but it's true. The kid comes back to the class with a lollipop half an hour later. Like you can be frustrated at that situation, right? You can be frustrated at dysregulated kids and know that behavior has got really bad in the last few years, worse, significantly worse. Um, and nobody seems to know what to do about it. That doesn't mean you don't love students. Those things can be true at the same time. You can love teaching and be a committed teacher and take a sick day or a mental health day. Those things aren't mutually exclusive, but I totally agree with you. I'm on a, um, I'm on a forum. One of the things I do do, I try and stay off social media, but I like to support teachers and principals. And so I'm on a forum where t principals ask questions. And, um, you know, for a principal to come on there and ask a question, you know, that took a lot. And then people shooting them down, like, come on, they wanted an answer, right? It's ridiculous. They had to come to a group of anonymous people they don't know to ask the answer, but they feel isolated and need help with it. If you have a solution, give it to them. Like, don't shoot each other down. So I agree with you. We need to kind of work together to fix the system. But, but with that, there's a lot of people in education who admire the problem. You know what I'm saying? They stand around complaining about it. I mean, the world needs action takers, and I'm yes. not a big advocate to be your union rep or anything else. God bless the people who are, but that's not me. But I'm not going to stand around just admire the problem. Like that's kind of just a drain on your energy, um, kind of. I mean, I agree with you. It is kind of disheartening. It's one of the reasons I got a social media <laughs> to see people. But, but do you know what I'm saying about competing? It's a habit we have, right? Like, well, I slept less or I have more work to grade or I have, you know, yeah, it's not a competition. It's crap for all of us, yeah. right? It shouldn't be... <laughs> 
<laughs> it, it shouldn't, you know, we should kind of support each other and try and help each other through it. But at the same time, you know, okay, I'll give you an example. I used to manage a lot of people, a lot of people. And one of the reasons I wanted to be a teacher was um, I don't mind children acting like children. It's when adults act like children, it really yes. annoys me. <laughs> and, right? and so when an adult would come to me and complain about another staff member and they did this and they did that and la, 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 la. And I was a very busy woman. You know, I was busy building a career, man. I was busy opening new offices, doing all these things. And then I would say, what did they say when you talked to them about it? Oh, well, I didn't talk to them about it. Oh, well, you come to complain to me. Like, you're an adult. Go talk to them about it. Try and resolve it. And then come talk to me if it they are unreasonable. But you know what I'm saying? That's admiring the problem. Like, I don't just, you know, I know it isn't great. What solutions do we have? And if you don't have solutions, that's okay. But don't shoot down everybody else's and say that's never going to work before you even looked at it, right? You know who those people are. That's never going to work. They got a problem for every solution right it's the opposite of so so anyway but i do agree with you um it is a very difficult um situation but there's still a lot of beauty and a lot of joy and a lot of fun to be had and in my own classroom i was the queen of my kingdom i mean i was really good at all the initiatives that came, everything that came my way, I would listen. I would be like, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. And, you know, give them a chance, take what you need, leave the rest. But I would say when I closed my door, I was a revolutionary. I was teaching long enough to know what the kids needed, how to give it to them, and how to kind of tune out all that other noise that was making it really negative. Because I could still make magic happen in the classroom. Um, but only when I was my best self and I'd set boundaries. Um, and then I was an effective teacher. Yeah, I, and I miss it. I, Just with all of our, we started with hashtag <laughs> teacher life, don't make it your whole identity. Ask me how much I miss it. I miss it a lot. And I'm somebody who has a lot of identity outside of teaching. I mean, I have a lot of hats that I wear and a lot of things that I do. But as far as things that simultaneously wore me out and frustrated me, and yet, were the most enriching and joyful parts of my day, it was teaching. My life is 100% easier since I stopped teaching. It is absolutely not as rich. Ooh. And I don't think I've ever that, admitted that before. That hit hard. I, you know, I... Right? I like I'm chewing up. I don't think I've admitted that to anybody else before. It is 100% easier. It is not as full. So, but it's a choice I made and I absolutely don't regret that choice, but I am sad for the me that spent some years burnt out and stressed and looking at my friends who are still in the classroom who are so stressed and not managing to find that magic, create that magic. Um, yeah, that, and that... not every day is magical. But not every day is magical, <laughs> Let's but, be honest. Let's keep but, it real. Right? but the moments that are really are, right? The moments that are, are unanticipated. They sneak up on you. They're not planned. They're the moments that you never would have been like, man, I had no idea that was going to happen today. How cool was that? Yeah. You, you bring up, I, I feel like I, I could respond to this in so many ways because yeah. I, you know, I have a lot of feelings about this. My my very first day of teaching, I wrote on a post-it note, you make a difference even on bad days. And I don't know if I just had a, a lightning bolt of wisdom coming my way, but I just felt like I needed to write that down. And it's been, it's stuck next to my, my computer ever since. And I think that, like you said, multiple things can be true. We can make a difference on bad days, yeah. and those bad days can be bad. And we can leave that school really bad. still having the worst of the days. It doesn't mean we didn't make a difference because I, you know, we talk about how teachers get into teaching because we want to make an impact, and that is so true. That doesn't mean that's the only thing we should get out of it. But we came into it for a reason. So you've talked a lot about you know how you you kind of think about yourself in those years where you were burnt out and 
kind of breathe a little bit over how much better I bet it could have been if, if you weren't. And I, I think I, I, I really truly value what you're doing with your retirement, which is sharing what you've learned so that teachers that are still in the classroom can stick with it. Because let's be honest, there are so many great teachers out there that are going to burn out and leave the classroom and never come back. And yeah. And you know, what's worse, Bryson, there are so many great teachers who are going to burn out and stay. That's True. damaging Ooh, to kids. That, Ooh, right? That was, it's that better to burn out, burn that out and stay. Hard. Burn out and stay. I mean, burn out, realize you're burnt out, make, you know, make some changes, get some support, get some resources. Listen, I'm going to tell you, you you just take responsibility for it. Your district is not going to hire me. I'm the PD you always wanted. I'm going to set you help you set boundaries, have effective communication skills with parents. I do a lot with nonviolent communication. I do a lot of like, you know, I'm a certified life coach. I didn't know if you knew that. Like I can do a lot to make people feel yeah. better um, and have more control over their life. Uh, not a lot of school districts want to hire me, I figured out. I'm going to train you how to say no to people. Oh, say no to the kids and the parents. Don't say no to us, right? <laughs> So like somehow people need to take ownership to go get the skills they need for themselves, not just to have a better experience of teaching, but have a better experience of life. Your own children deserve the best of you. I mean, that was the hardest part for me, teacher guilt. You give all of yourself at school, hashtag teacher life, come home and be like horrible to my own children. They were the, they had the worst science fair projects. I didn't have time for that. Right. I'm busy helping 32 fourth graders have the perfect you know hypothesis uh so um no it's about balance it's about taking accountability it's about recognizing that you deserve to take care of yourself and just a really simple concept for people if you just keep this in your head would you treat your child that way when you decide you're not going to go to the doctor you're not going to take get the rest you need um, you're going to keep going you're going to let a parent be abusive to you because you just don't want to be seen as the high maintenance teacher or whatever else would you tell a parent's bullying you would you tell your kid if your kid's getting bullied at school uh suck it up buttercup heck no you wouldn't tell your kid that why are you telling yourself that oh i shouldn't be take it so personal well their behavior is inexcusable somebody needs to back you up on that right so um that's the takeaway i would give people there is no easy answer it's the work of a lifetime thanks for saying i say it like it is dude i'm pushing 60 man i'm running out of time <laughs> there's no time to make it soft and cute around the edges <laughs> i mean there just isn't like at a certain point in life you just get like i'm gonna say what i say and and think what i think because um yeah you don't know i, I regret the times that i spent in a fetal position under the desk, crying, hiding from kids over lunch. Like I shouldn't have ever let it get to that point. And there was a lot of reasons for it. And yes, the educational system is brutal, but at the same time, you know, I'm an adult. If I didn't have the skills, it was on me to learn the skills. I no, the, the school district isn't gonna come and say, here, let me teach you the skills you need to take care of yourself. You just gotta like, take accountability and learn the skills. I appreciate this conversation so much. And <laughs> I, I just want to thank you for sharing so oh, sure. bluntly and, and actionably. And can you tell us very briefly a little bit about the workshop that, Hey, if you're watching live, oh, you yeah. can comment yeah, boundaries to, to learn more about how you can come to a full length <laughs> workshop about how yeah. to solve so it's all the problems we've been talking about. All the problems in the world. No, it's not going to solve all the problems in the world, but it'll give you a good framework. And and some ideas so it is called um boundary bliss and the secret to working less and living more and it is going to be a one hour master class um so it will follow this has been a little all over the place you know but it will have a structure
you know, the misconception is boundaries is just learning to say no. Oh, it's so much more than that. Um, it'll give you the opportunity to get a fantastic tool that can help you see where your boundary blind spots are. A lot of people have issues um, in school and outside of school and don't recognize that perhaps um, the mm -hmm. ways in which they're suffering um, are due to a boundary issue boundaries is a buzzword now but anyway so that's it and it's next tuesday at five o'clock uh pacific time eight o'clock eastern time and yes i believe if you put boundaries in there or reach out reach out to bryson he yeah, has just send us a email. it's specifically for i mean it will help everybody but this is specifically with a focus for music teachers because that's what he does and we're um, we're putting it on together Grace. All right. This was fun. I appreciate it. I loved I saw your cat's tail go past. Yeah, she's been actually um, pretty good not getting on the table she, lately. So she's, she's hanging, very, hanging out on she's my feet. Very cool. Very cool. Um, I apologize to everybody for saying my number one strategy was to um, get off social media. Sorry, that's me. Maybe that isn't you. <laughs> if it's what gives you joy, if that's what gives you joy, go for it. It must give people joy. I mean, why else are they doing it? There's millions of people. That's what they do. Um, so uh, it's just uh, not for me. Uh, it's, I, I, sa I sound old like my dad right now. Oh, my technology. <laughs> he, was, he was convinced television, he, called, he never once referred to television as anything other than the idiot box. Um, he uh, was convinced television was the end of humanity, and um, yeah, here I am. Um, I'm not. I, I'm not even um, up and coming enough to be freaked out about um, AI. I, I'm still worrying what social media is doing to little kids. <laughs> but anyway, we're using it for good now. We're using it for good, Bryson. Thank you so much for this All conversation. Right. If you are wanting to make some boundaries and defend those boundaries so that you can continue enjoying teaching and making sure that yeah. you're not making teaching your whole thing, um, yeah. please join us for this workshop. Send us a DM over on Instagram at that, at that music teacher and send me boundaries and I will send you a link to the free workshop. Um, Grace, thank you so much for joining us yeah. and it's everybody else. In case nobody has told you lately, thank you so much for making a difference in the lives of the students that you teach.